And uh, do you prefer people asking live questions during presentation or do you prefer people asking at the end? Uh, just asking because with Zoom webinar, we can enable mics now or we can wait till later, just based on your preference. Oh, hmm. um, hard to say. I guess uh, I'm open to questions during it, but if it's like, yeah, if it's like a particularly targeted question, I guess. Okay, so uh, attendees, you may get a notification from me saying your mic is enabled. Uh, so then you'll be able to unmute yourself at your leisure. Cool. And then Sarah, I just dropped the um, YouTube link as well. And then let me let me share this out with everyone. Great. Thanks, Kim. And welcome everyone. Yeah, we'll get started here in just a few minutes. Let some more people join us. Uh, really excited to have Aria and Sarah joining us from IC3 today, um, sharing their new research that they've been working on around stable coins. If you have questions, definitely feel free to drop them into the YouTube chat and we'll be able to share those as we go along um, throughout the presentation. And Perfect. And are you, are you, are you ready, ready to go? Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, really excited to have IC3 and Arya joining to share his new research. Uh, really want to thank Sarah for helping uh, set this up and uh, all the work and, and research that everyone is doing over at IC3. If you have questions throughout, drop them into the YouTube chat if you're listening there. If you're in the Zoom with us, uh, feel free to share your Q&A. We've also enabled talking so you can just raise your hand and then we can unmute you. Um, without further ado, Sarah, yeah, I'll let you uh, introduce and share a little bit more about IC3 and um, everything that Aria is working on. Yeah, thanks, Keenan. So, hey, everyone. My name is Sarah Allen. I am the community manager for the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Contracts, uh, IC3. IC3 is an academic blockchain research initiative based at Cornell Tech with researchers at nine global campuses. And Chainlink is an IC3 partner. So thanks today to Chainlink for hosting this webinar. Uh, Araya Klagesmund is an applied math PhD student at Cornell. His research brings together economics and computer science to study the design of DeFi protocols and economic networks. And he's also working on the gyroscope stablecoin. And Araya, I will turn it over to you. Thanks for the intro, Sarah. Uh, yeah, I'm Araya Klagesmund. I'm a PhD student at Cornell. And I'll run you guys through a little bit of my uh, PhD research on uh, what I call the un- reasonable design of stable coins, reasonable and unreasonable. So the past year or so has been really a year of DeFi. Uh, DeFi assets under management has grown basically like 50X or even more uh, in that time. And the system uh, of DeFi protocols has also become much bigger, but also much more complex. So it's been a year of DeFi, but it's also been a year of DeFi crises. So in particular, about a year ago, back in March to 2020, uh, DAI, there was a, a large ETH crash. And uh, this led to sort of deleveraging spirals, something that we'll talk about a little, a little bit more later as part of my research uh, in the DAI system, which led to increased volatility and kind of like a short squeeze effect uh, on the DAI stablecoin. And it had some side effects then that led to uh, sort of like maker auctions being liquidated for zero die and sort of like minor extractable value occurring around uh, these liquidation events. There's also been a number of other things over the past year, including uh, sort of like money loopholes, uh, ability to steal money from different protocols, uh, actual attacks on protocols that sort of uh, uh, made use of, of Oracle quirks, uh, actual other attacks on, uh, on minor extractable, extractable value on stable coins, and then uh, recently, this past winter, uh, the introduction of some of these new algorithmic stable coins that uh, then proceeded to crash, such as basis cash, empty set dollar. Uh, there were also other uh, stable coin crashes, such as around origin dollar and a hack in that system. And very recently, uh, the sort of struggled launch of uh, the Fey stable coin. 
So that kind of motivates uh, my research in this area on stable coins. Um, and here we're thinking of a stable coin as uh, basically a cryptocurrency where there's this added economic structure. And the aim of this added structure is to stabilize the price or purchasing power. Uh, and some of the issues we have in this area that uh, are sort of motivated by these, uh, these past examples are that we lack really good risk-based models that span this design space and help us understand the different trade-offs when we're designing these systems. And that's kind of where this work comes, uh, aims to fill in, kind of filling the gap and sort of seeding uh, where the, the, the right sort of questions to ask and models to start using in future stablecoin research. And so in this talk, I'm going to go through a little bit of decomposition of, of how we think about the design space of stablecoins, uh, then sort of motivate two primary fundamental design questions around stablecoins that we're going to start to answer, and then answer, start to answer those using uh, models of price dynamics of these systems, and then models of uh, what we call governance extractable value and uh, GEV or end minor extractable value, MEV in these systems to sort of help understand are these systems secure. And this work is based on uh, these four papers, which are all available on archive. So uh, if you really like the talk, do look these up. Uh, and then uh, this is with co-authors, uh, including Dominic Hartz and Louis Gudgeon, uh, uh, Sam Werner and uh, Daniel Perez at, uh, at Imperial College London. And then also my advisor, Andrea Minka at Cornell. So let's start by decomposing uh, the design space of running you through how I like to think of stable coins. So one of the first uh, distinctions to make, I think, is between stable coins that are based on custodial mechanisms and stable coins that are non-custodial. So this is an example of uh, on the custodial side, we have Tether, and on the non-custodial side, we have DAI. And on the custodial side, uh, we have risks around sort of counterparty credit risk, uh, censorship risk, and traditional sort of financial risks and how these uh, you know, banking sort of systems are set up. And the good thing is that these are well understood, uh, but the bad thing is that uh, this is kind of the risk we are trying to minimize by entering the cryptocurrency space in the first place. And then on the non-custodial side, uh, we have sort of new risks and attacks that we have to first map out what are the risks and then uh, help to solve in terms of like, how should we be designing to mitigate these risks? And as we'll see, there are risks around sort of deleveraging crises in these uh, sort of stable coins, uh, risks around sort of price feed and governance manipulations, and more generally sort of like minor extractable value on the, on the base chain, because miners have the ability to uh, reorder transactions to their benefit. And then also the risks around sort of like smart contract bugs and how these things are actually implemented and whether an attacker could manipulate that, uh, uh, those implementations. And the problem here is that these are not as well understood, and that's kind of where this, uh, this research leads. So the custodial uh, side, we can kind of map out uh, along the lines of sort of traditional finance and traditional financial models. I won't really focus on this in this talk, but I'll give just a, a basic overview. There's, there's more information in our papers. Um, but basically, you can think of these as uh, one type being basically a fully reserved fund. And this is uh, basically like USDC, uh, BUSD that would fit in here. And it kind of acts like, a, like an ETF sort of model, as in you can mint and redeem uh, essentially shares or uh, tokens of these stable, on these stable coins uh, in return for the underlying collateral through the issuer. Then there are other types that are kind of more parallel to like traditional banks or, or sort of like money market funds. And these are sort of like fractional reserved funds that are kind of like fully collateralized, but uh, sort of like fractionally liquid, liquid collateralized. Um, and then you can similarly like interact with these uh, custodians to uh, create and redeem the supply, but they have sort of also uh, added threshold risks uh, akin to like uh, how banks work. And then on the other side, you also have uh, sort of like central banks that could come out with uh, central bank digital currencies. Um, but right, uh, we're going to sort of focus on the other side through the rest of this talk on the non-custodial uh, design of stable coins. And so here, I like to break it down first as, as a first distinction in terms of like, where are these uh, stable coins getting their value? What sort of collateral are backing these systems? And in one case we have like in DAI, exogenous collateral. So something like ETH where there's sort of uh, enough scope to this collateral that it's, uh, it moves relatively independently of the stable coin system itself. And these have uh, what we'll see as market deleveraging risks uh, through the rest of this talk. 
There's also a type of endogenous collateral. And this is where there's been essentially a new collateral asset that's been created uh, for the specific reason of being collateral in these systems. But that also means that it's very, uh, the value of this, uh, this collateral is very tied to sort of like expectations in this particular system. And that's why it's an endogenous. And we'll see that this has sort of like amplified uh, feedback effects as opposed to the exogenous collateral case. And then there's also a type of what we call implicit collateral. And this is kind of the basis to uh, type uh, stablecoin design. And we'll see that this uh, essentially works by trying to set up uh, that there's like an incentive to absorb risk in these systems during a crisis, but there's no sort of like forward looking obligation uh, from this point in time. It really comes down to speculators uh, becoming uh, choosing to absorb the risk in the actual uh, uh, crisis. And we'll go over a little bit of this uh, in more detail uh, in a coming slide as well. So right, this is the area we're gonna focus on uh, in the rest of this talk. So to sort of motivate how these systems work, uh, let's go through kind of like how a, a CDO type structure sort of works. And this is how most stable coins today uh, actually work. So in a CDO design, we have a portfolio of underlying assets. And we split this portfolio into two tranches. Uh, one tranche is a junior tranche, which is uh, sort of more risky. And then there's a senior tranche, and the idea is that this is uh, less risky. And then if there's a loss that's incurred, this is first borne by the junior tranche, uh, and the senior tranche is protected. And the idea with, uh, with stable coins then is that there's a risk absorber, which kind of takes the place of this uh, junior tranche, and a stable coin holder. Uh, the stablecoin holders are sort of fulfilling the senior tranche uh, with trying to be protected if there are downfalls. And then there's an added mechanism where if there is enough sort of like a, of a crisis event, uh, there's a deleveraging process that uh, dynamically adjusts the supply so that uh, it's kind of like a continual system. So that essentially the CDO structure can continue into the future uh, just in like a downsized form. The space of stable coins is a, a bit more expansive than just this though. Um, and so I'll try to like motivate some uh, several different areas here. We've already touched on this like idea of primary value or sort of the collateral backing the system. Uh, and right, this is sort of spans from exogenous collateral to endogenous collateral and uh, what we term implicit collateral. And then there's another sort of function in the system of uh, who actually is absorbing the risk uh, through this sort of like primary value. And in one case, we have sort of like uh, equity risk absorption, where there's some sort of like uh, uniform equity token in the system. And holders of this token are basically all absorbing, uh, supposed to absorb the risk in the system, as opposed to there are other systems where there are agents who are making their own sort of custom decisions about, uh, about how to absorb risk in these systems. Um, and then there are newer sorts of systems where the protocol is kind of designed to absorb risk itself as kind of like a, a reserve or insurance based sort of mechanism. So let's uh, sort of like go through a little bit of how this, uh, how this works. Uh, the main type uh, that I was alluding to earlier is this leveraged based sort of design. This is like the CDO model that we uh, just stepped through. And here we can have, uh, it, it can be based on exogenous or endogenous collateral. Um, and senior in shares it's, is, a, is a term that's kind of thrown around too to describe uh, some of these systems. And it's kind of a subcase of this leverage based system. So essentially, here we have a market in senior in shares. There's like a market cap of endogenous equity shares. And the idea is that these equity shares absorb, uh, are meant to absorb the volatility in the system. So this is looking back at, uh, at, uh, at the diagram here, where you have sort of like endogenous collateral, but also equity risk absorption in that case. And then there's another type, uh, the basis sort of design, or what we term implicit collateral. And in here, speculators are meant to maintain the peg by betting on future supply expansion, uh, something that's akin to like betting on leverage in this implicit collateral, kind of like backing the system during a crisis. And the idea here is that there's no pre-committed collateral as there would be in these leverage-based uh, systems before, but instead, essentially like the speculators are coming in and either deciding it's profitable or not profitable to reduce the supply voluntarily. Um, and in doing so, they kind of have to like, in, in judging if it's profitable, they essentially have to bet that the supply is going to expand beyond this like pre-crisis sort of level uh, or else the system kind of like, uh, this, 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 uh, 
this basis type design uh, doesn't really work. And that's kind of also like what we've been experiencing uh, in, in the past winter with the, the rollout of these, these basis type designs. And then there's another type, which is uh, basically reserve backed. Uh, and in here, the idea is that the protocol maintains uh, its own balance sheet and uses this balance sheet uh, to market make around the peg. Um, and then there are some key questions around here, around like what actually makes up this balance sheet and uh, sort of like various attacks to whether you can exhaust that balance sheet and sort of break the peg. Uh, but it's another type of design that's also being rolled out these days. There are also various types of meta stable coins that are basically combinations of all of these different uh, uh, sort of lower level stable coins. So moving on to sort of the rest of the, uh, the types of uh, functions in these systems, we've we just covered sort of different types of risk absorption. But this is also intimately connected with, uh, with an in issuance function. And here, uh, issuance can be agent-based, uh, which it kind of is in DAI essentially. If you're opening a vault in DAI, you are deciding sort of how much uh, stable coins to issue from that, uh, uh, from that vault. And so deciding uh, in aggregate, what should the, uh, the supply of DAI be? And there's also different sorts of algorithmic issuance, uh, uh, which is where these algorithmic sort of designs come in. And there's also this deleveraging process that we alluded to earlier, which is uh, sort of behind the scenes in all of these different designs, which is also essentially algorithmic. And then there are stablecoin holders who are seeking, seeking stability uh, through holding this asset. And then sort of like behind the scenes, there's also like governance that needs to update the system and similarly price feeds that need to say what these assets are actually worth. And then further behind the scenes, there are miners who always have the ability to reorder transactions uh, to their benefit. So we can sort of map out how these different stable coins today uh, fall along several different axes. So this, this is showing like how they fall within three particular, particular uh, dimensions. One being what type of risk absorber is there? Another type, uh, what, what is, where's the primary value coming from? And then in the, the sort of like third dimension, uh, how is issuance happening, whether it's agent-based or algorithmic. Um, I'll sort of put out the slides later if you want to peek into this in more detail, uh, but just very briefly uh, sort of sketching out some of the issues that's come up here. In Black Thursday, we saw that uh, there were sort of deleveraging crises in, in some of these designs like DAI. Um, we've also seen that other sort of implicit collateral designs uh, fall apart, uh, the market for these fall apart. Uh, here's an example of Nubits, and recently this past winter, sort of both basis cash and empty set dollar. And these senior shares types designs also uh, have problems. And so whenever we're making new designs, we should have this in mind as, as uh, essentially like a case study. And so Steam dollars uh, ran into quite a lot of trouble back in uh, 2019, 2020. And then very recently, the rollout of Fay uh, led to several sort of liquidity problems uh, in how the mark how the protocol is actually market making uh, using its balance sheet. Uh, I also then briefly want to sketch out kind of like how do we think about different types of algorithmic stablecoins, um, and sort of approaching this. Uh, whenever a new user is coming into the system, essentially, um, they are paying if if the system's working. That new user is paying a dollar for each newly minted stablecoin. And one key question here is where does that dollar actually go? And we sort of map out a spectrum upon which it can go. Uh, sort of on one extreme, it goes to sort of the pockets of, uh, of stakeholders in the system. Uh, and on another extreme, it goes completely to the, uh, the protocol's balance sheet. And, and then there's a uh, room for in between where it can go partially to both. And then the next sort of key question is what happens in a crisis in these different sort of design choices? And in the case, in, in one extreme where it's going sort of like to, uh, to stakeholders, that means that the system is not retaining extra value essentially to handle crises. Uh, and it's solely relying on sort of speculators to jump in in these situations. And if they don't find it profitable to jump in in those situations, essentially if a sort of future demand growth uh, becomes less credible, then the system doesn't work. And then somewhere in between where it's like partially going to the reserve, partially going to stakeholders. In this case, the reserve is kind of smaller than it could have been, but it's there. Uh, it means it's potentially less stabilizing, uh, but it also means it's prone to sort of like bank run style risks. And this needs to be like a critical concern when designing these systems. And the other case is when 100% of it goes to the reserve. In this case, it's 
basically strictly stronger as in there's more value to work with in a crisis. Um, uh, and there, there's, there, there's still worries about it, uh, but, uh, but it's strictly stronger than, uh, than, than some of these other designs. And we're sort of seeing this with the rollout of, uh, of algorithmic stablecoins so far. So we've seen sort of empty set dollar, basis cash, and sort of similar designs like dynamic set dollar, all essentially failing to maintain their peg. And so sort of the extreme on this side uh, definitely seems to be not working. We've also seen similar things uh, historically with new bits, which is kind of in between, but further to the side of, uh, of all the way to the, uh, to the left. And then there are some several on ongoing experiments around sort of like fractional reserve designs. And then there are also some experiments here on the, the other side. Uh, and so we're gonna keep like kind of a keen eye uh, on these going forward. Um, but there are also like several other dimensions than just, just this one dimension to think about. Um, uh, so here, for instance, there's sort of like a, it's very important to think about the composition of what are the actual assets in these reserves? What are their risks? And basically are those assets valuable when you need them in a crisis? And then uh, a follow-up question of, how does the protocol actually maintain liquidity in the system, and how liquid uh, how liquid does that of a system does that lead to? And this sort of like contributed to some of the uh, the, the problems in the Fay launch. And so these are sort of like three primary dimensions I like to think about in terms of analyzing different uh, algorithmic stablecoins. Another uh, sort of area of difference I want to point out before leading into sort of the main uh, models and results. Is sort of like parallels and differences between uh, the, the governance sort of uh, setups of these systems and sort of like uh, how do how do these compare to traditional money? And so here I'm going to compare sort of like the DAI system to the traditional money system, uh, but similar other designs can also be compared. Sort of on the top level, we have uh, on, on the DAI side, maker governance, and this is kind of parallel to how the central bank is acting in traditional money. But a key difference here is that we can usually assume that a, a proper central bank is a stability seeking kind of for its own right. It's targeting economic stability in a sense, whereas maker governance is really designed to be profit optimizing. And so we have to take that into account when we're sort of thinking about these systems. Then a, lo a level lower uh, on the DAI side, we have uh, DAI vaults or CDPs. And this is kind of parallel to how commercial banks operate in the traditional money system. Um, essentially, vaults are here to absorb uh, risk and sort of determine the issuance of an endogenous stable asset or the, the DAI stablecoin itself. Uh, this is kind of parallel to what commercial banks are essentially doing by making loans, um, except that on the commercial bank side, we can basically assume that the asset that's being generated is stable, uh, sort of as backed by the central bank, whereas in the vault case, we really have to sort of be worried about that this is an endogenous asset and it's working it's either stable or not stable based on how we set up the system. And then sort of at the bottom level, we have DAI holders, which are kind of uh, parallel to depositors then uh, at the actual commercial banks and traditional money. And as we're sort of seeing here, because of these sort of key differences, uh, we sort of need new models to think about, uh, about the non-custodial setting. And so this sort of motivates two fundamental questions that are then uh, sort of we're trying to answer with the rest of our, uh, our, our research in this area. So the first question is around incentive security. And so basically this is asking, is there mutually profitable continued participation across all of the parties in these systems? Or basically, is it, is it profitable for everybody, for everybody to participate with these, uh, these terms? And this has to take into account sort of like the attack potential of these systems, the sort of like equilibrium interest rates that uh, they need to fund these systems. Um, and two key things we're worried about is sort of what we call governance extractable value, because there are governance uh, systems uh, as part of these systems that are sort of updating either parameters or basically even changing the systems over time, upgrading the contracts directly. And they could do these in sort of like uh, best interests of the protocol, and that's the aim, but they also have sort of like other avenues that may be more profitable and sort of the design of these systems has to uh, understand that and take that into account. And then there's similar problems around the lines of uh, minor extractable value, where basically uh, miners are ev they're even more abstract sort of like governance process behind the scenes of the uh, base layer and deciding the ordering of transactions in these systems. And then the second question is basically, after we know that uh, there's participation in these systems, we can then ask, are 
uh, are the incentives actually leading to stable outcomes? And this is what we call economic stability in these systems. And so to address these, uh, these two questions, we're developing three different types of models, one around understanding price dynamics in these systems. Basically, how do the issuance incentives either lead to stability or instability? And then two types of models to help understand governance extractable value and minor extractable value. And so we're gonna to touch on the price dynamic models first, and then also touch a little bit on the other ones uh, in a little bit. Um, sort of to set up the landscape with these price dynamic models, uh, in the traditional financial literature, we usually start from uh, a setting where we assume that there's like a stable asset, and this asset is borrowed against some collateral, say, and then there may be feedback effects in the system, but it's sort of on the collateral asset liquidity side, um, as opposed to on the actual stable asset side. And this is one of the key areas where non-custodial stable coins are different because this stable asset essentially has an endogenous price and participation, and this needs to be factored into these models. And so we sort of need expanded models that help us understand this. And so as part of our work, we've been setting up sort of stochastic models to understand these sort of endogenous stablecoin prices um, as part of two papers. And this leads to uh, sort of this effect we term as deleveraging spirals, which are essentially short squeeze like effects that amplify sort of collateral drawdown in liquidity crises. And this also leads to sort of like regions we can describe uh, as stable and other regions we can des describe as unstable for these stable coins. So to illustrate a little bit of what we mean by these models, although I won't go through the fine details, um, we set up sort of a system with two different types of agents. One is a stable coin holder, and these are uh, people who are seeking stability uh, and have also like an imperfectly elastic demand uh, for these stable coins. And another type of agent that's a speculator who is essentially deciding the supply behind these stable coins uh, secured by a collateral position. And so this is essentially modeling the, the sort of uh, leverage based stable coins we were describing earlier. And then there are two types of assets in this system. There's the, the collateral asset or ETH itself, which is a risky asset, which we're assuming has an exogenous price. Uh, although you can start to change these systems to build in an endogenous price as well and sort of like map out what happens there. And then the other asset is the stable coin with an endogenous price that's sort of determined through market interactions between these uh, different types of agents. And this stable coin is over collateralized in ETH but again, it's, uh, its actual stability depends on this stablecoin market that's clearing sort of demand and supply. So let's illustrate a little bit about like what the speculator, uh, how they're making decisions in this model. So they have a collateral constraint. And the idea here is that the protocol is basically enforcing a degree of over collateralization uh, within the protocol itself. And so this is sort of set up by this equation, but basically the idea is that uh, the amount of ETH that the, uh, the speculator locks into the system, the value of that ETH has to be greater than or equal to some collateral factor times how many stable coins they've actually generated through the system. And then they're making a decision uh, that's deciding how much they want to change the stable coin supply to sort of maximize their expected returns into the future, uh, taking into account this constraint. And this is what we're calling sort of like the honest behavior, because if they're, this is how speculators are intended to, to behave in these systems. And so we set up an optimization problem that essentially does this. The, the important thing is that there's a, a value uh, function that sort of defines uh, how profitable this, this is into the future for these uh, speculators. And this has to take into account this liquidation effect where basically uh, either the speculator is like self -vol voluntarily liquidating to like preemptively handle uh, sort of like their leverage or the protocol can also like directly liquidate their positions if it breaches this threshold. And that comes with extra costs and market effects. And this, the speculator has to take this into account in their decision-making. There are some other assumptions that also go into this to make it more attractable. And we'll touch on one of these uh, later sort of in the discussion. And so then some, uh, this, uh, this model leads to some very interesting results. Uh, one, of, one of them is sort of in the area of uh, Sometimes we can really think of these systems as very stable, actually. Um, and so just kind of like at a high level describe these results. The first result is that uh, these are, there, there's sort of, we can bound the probability of large deviations in these systems within, within a certain region. 
And this is sort of describing the, uh, the, the stable region of these stable coins. Uh, and a technical idea sort of how we get there is using dubes inequality, uh, but you don't have to focus on that. Um, you can see the paper sort of for more details. The second result then is sort of bounding, uh, in addition to sort of just like bounding large price deviations, we can bound actually this like idea of uh, large quadratic variation or essentially describing like how variable the process is, how much it moves around uh, in this similar regime. And so both of these sort of mean that uh, uh, that the stable coin is, has quite contained price ranges uh, within this like stable region. And the technical idea behind uh, the second result is using Burkholter's inequality. Uh, then sort of on the flip side, there's also uh, another sort of distinct region where we can think of this as being an unstable system. Uh, and this is pretty important to sort of like see the difference here. Um, so in the first result here, in this different uh, region, uh, we characterize how the stable coin experiences essentially a short squeeze or what we call a deleveraging spiral or very formally, uh, the stable coin has what we call sub martingale prices that are sort of like increasing or expected to increase. And sort of the idea here, uh, I can kind of illustrate it quickly, um, is that in equilibrium, the stable coin sort of uh, has demand equaling supply. And then there's, uh, there's this like excess of collateral sort of backing the supply. And now if there is a liquidation, uh, essentially that means that some of the collateral is being used to reduce the supply essentially by buying back on the, uh, on the open market. But this means that demand is now out of sync with supply which means then that uh, in an inelastic uh, market for these stable coins, the price of the stable coin has to increase. Uh, and then that uh, ends up sort of resetting demand and supply. But it also means that if there's a second round of liquidations, because there's a higher price to the stable coin, there's this short squeeze type effect, uh, more collateral actually has to be used uh, in this second round of liquidations uh, to do the same sort of decrease to the supply which in turn makes the price actually increase further. So this is this short squeeze type effect, um, uh, which brings the system back into balance, but sort of like this can keep happening. And it means that uh, there's faster collateral drawdown, increasing prices, but also like, even though it's increasing prices, it's a drastically riskier system because of this uh, sort of dynamic with collateral. We then sort of like uh, can characterize also like that even though there's this like short squeeze effect, um, this is actually distinctly uh, higher variance that's happening in this setting as well compared to the, the stable setting. So in, in one result, uh, we have sort of like in this different regime, uh, this, uh, in, in this different regime, there's, we can characterize a variance approximation, actually it's telling like how much the, uh, uh, the, the, the price is wiggling around and that this approximation increases by, uh, by quite a large amount uh, as the ETH uh, return uh, sort of shock scales, or also as like the initial collateralization decreases. Um, so this means then that like this variance approximation, uh, the variance is much higher in this unstable region uh, as opposed to the stable region, which helps us solidify that, yes, this is actually uh, less stable. And the technical idea behind this is using uh, an implicit function theorem. And then we can go even further uh, as, instead of using the variance approximation itself, we can actually use sort of like a forward looking idea of variance and show that indeed in the uh, stable and unstable reg regimes, this is a, a good interpretation because forward looking vari uh, variance is much higher in, uh, in the unstable regime as opposed to the stable regime. Um, and this builds on some technical ideas around uh, inequalities on variances of uh, convex functions of random variables. We also can back this up with, uh, with some simulations in, in a simpler agent-based model that we constructed in a different paper. Um, and essentially, uh, this histogram is kind of showing this. In certain uh, regions, we can, uh, like this orange uh, sort of region, the, uh, the returns of the stable coin are much more constrained than uh, in this unstable sort of region or blue region, where it's much greater uh, variation in, in the, uh, the, the returns that are realized. And then this is essentially what happened on Black Thursday uh, in, in March 2020, when we had like a very big ETH price crash, and it le led to essentially this short squeeze like effect that you can see in DAI on this, uh, this plot in the right hand side, which is showing you sort of like liquidation, uh, the, the prices of, uh, of DEX trades as liquidations are happening uh, over, over several days here. 
And this sort of a short squeeze effect persisted for quite a while. Um, and uh, actually uh, several changes to the maker system had to be built in to sort of like bring it back toward peg. Um, and this sort of leads to some interesting complications, which we can also understand in the context of this model. So one is interesting point is that uh, one of the assumptions we had to make to get these nice results, uh, nice analytic results, is that uh, there are essentially like sub martingale prices uh, in the collateral asset, which is meaning that uh, uh, in simpler terms, that speculators are thinking that this, uh, this collateral asset, they're expecting it to increase in price or at least stay the same. Um, and intuitively this makes sense uh, because um, no, one's, no one's going to participate in these systems if they don't think they're gonna make a profit and they have to go leverage long in these systems to, uh, 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 to participate. So they essentially have to bet on this happening. And this means that there's, there's no results about a stable regime if this, uh, this sort of assumption falls apart, which realistically it does fall apart sometimes. Uh, and then an interesting sort of side effect of this is kind of a seeming contradiction in the design of these systems. So the idea here is that our goal with a, a non-custodial or decentralized stable coin is that uh, we want something that's fully decentralized, but we can only really fully stabilize it if we have like many uncorrelated assets that are backing it, um, which today, realistically, those uncorrelated assets are currently custodial. And so we can't really do this without bringing in some sort of custodial asset or sort of like different designs into the mix. And there's been sort of several solutions to try to address this. So I'll give like a brief overview of this and sort of like ideas we have toward addressing it. Maker since Black Thursday has essentially tethered uh, DAI to USDC, which imports custodial risks from USDC. And the idea here is that they set up this PEG stability module or PSM, where this, this PSM is maintaining direct exchangeability and in the pro with USDC and in the process, essentially building up like a USDC uh, sort of in these crisis situations. And then there are other approaches uh, such as what Rai is doing, uh, which is instituting negative rates during crisis. Um, but this leads to sort of a, uh, a question of like, do, do people in equilibrium participate in these systems given that they could experience negative rates? Uh, and this is sort of like also depend on how long those negative rates have to happen. And then there are other sort of designs around like liquidity buffers, which are essentially dedicated liquidity pools uh, for, for sort of helping out in crises. Um, and so we suggested a sort of form of a uh, vault insurance and maker and liquidity today is also doing something rather similar in some of their, uh, uh, so something like liquidity, liquidity buffer to sort of handle uh, liquidations as they come up. And then there's a sort of a generalization of what Maker was doing with the PSM, which is more general reserved backed mechanisms to sort of like help maintain exchangeability with not necessarily a dollar's worth of USDC, but a dollar's worth of assets. Um, and this is like a generalization of, of what Maker is doing. So, so far we've sort of like addressed the second question around economic stability. Um, and we'll sort of shift tack now to sort of think about the first question of, uh, of incentive security. So again, the idea here was sort of like, um, how do we understand governance extractable value, minor extractable value in these systems? And given sort of the risks and sort of like different attacks that can happen, do people choose to participate in, this, in these systems compared to alternatives? And to sort of motivate the uh, thinking about these questions, um, there are several events over the last year, such as uh, uh, when there was uh, pointed out sort of like a flash attack that was possible in Maker, where governance, if they wanted to, could have chosen to just uh, upgrade the system and essentially uh, be able to mint infinite die and sort of like uh, exhaust the uh, 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 the collateral in the system. And then also many instances of essentially rug pulls in these systems. So we think of governance extractable value as a more general case of, of just an explicit rug pull, where, uh, where if you're rug pulling the system, this is governance just directly choosing, I wanna uh, steal the collateral in the system, but they could also do this indirectly. And it's sort of like hard to pick out what is the difference between like uh, a rug pull and uh, sort of just like natural outcomes of the system. And this is where really thinking about governance extractable value is important. So we have then two, uh, two types of models that, that help us think about these things. 
Um, and the first is uh, helping to think about governance extractable value using what we call capital structure models. And these models were originally a type of model to describe IPO incentives in traditional finance. And we're essentially taking those models and expanding them to think about uh, stablecoin incentives and attacks in these new types of non-custodial systems. And so here to set, up, to set it up, we have three types of assets, a collateral asset uh, like, like ETH before, a stablecoin asset, and then a new governance token, um, which is uh, sort of saying like, if you own this governance token, you have a voting power in changing the system through, through the governance process. And then there are three types of agents. There's as before, a risk absorber or sort of like the vault in, uh, in Maker, uh, a stablecoin holder, and then an outside governance holder who is actually like determining the governance process and holding these, uh, these governance tokens. And then uh, you can consider some further variations of this too, and we do that uh, in the paper, but you can, you can check that for, for full details. So we set up first a very simple case of this where there are no attack vectors. And so this is essentially just like directly adapting these capital structure models to this setting. Um, and I won't go through the details of the particular setup, but the general idea is that we have sort of a game theory problem that's set up where you have a, a governance optimization problem. And in this problem, governance is deciding an interest rate to sort of maximize their, their revenue, uh, but taking into account how the vault uh, is going to respond to this, uh, to this interest rate decision by deciding the issuance in the system. And then the vault uh, on the flip side is, uh, is, is deciding the issuance in the system to maximize their expected returns um, subject to several constraints. So the original collateral constraint, if we're considering the maker type system, a participation constraint, uh, essentially saying like, is it profitable enough to participate in this compared to some alternative? And then the stablecoin market pricing, sort of like how that market works out uh, itself uh, as another constraint. And then we sort of build from this very simple model into adding various governance uh, attacks uh, and modeling how, how this changes the system. Uh, and the idea here is that in this problem too, we might have a fraction of governors who can steal a fraction of collateral uh, at some expense of their like share of the governance tokens, uh, essentially like if governance tokens value went to zero, plus some outside cost to attack alpha, which is kind of a parameter describing how much centralized recourse we have uh, sort of like through traditional legal means, so to say. And here, now that the problems are changing a little bit because in the governance problem, they're deciding an interest rate, but now they're also deciding, do they want to attack the system? Uh, and then the vault problem is changing by uh, sort of factoring in this, uh, this attack possibility. And we also set up like even more complicated ones where there's more complicated uh, sort of collusion attacks that could happen, but essentially like agents could collude to restrict the exit of other agents um, and indirectly steal collateral. Uh, and then in this case, uh, it, the other agents in the system uh, may essentially want to bid up the price of the governance token or essentially issue like bribes to governors to make sure that, that this doesn't happen, that they don't choose to attack the system. Uh, and so the, the problem changes in other sort of like subtle ways and adds in sort of like a stablecoin holder uh, uh, optimization problem as well. So it becomes much more complicated. Uh, but there are several sort of interesting takeaways coming out of this, uh, which I'll, I'll go over a little bit more detail. The idea is that the governance uh, token fundamental value is kind of related to the, the future discounted fees that are coming into the system that they might hope to, uh, to accrue. And this is sort of the idea of like the honest governance uh, fees. Uh, the value to honest governance. And if this is small relative to sort of like the actual value or collateral in the system, it's essentially guaranteed then that you need a high alpha parameter to actually have a secure system. Uh, and this leads to what we call as a price of anarchy, um, which is kind of this extra cost to secure a decentralized system compared to a centralized system, uh, which is reflected in this like high value of alpha. So we, based on this conjecture that a lot of very flexible designs that are fully decentralized are actually uh, impossible to realize as in like nobody chooses to participate in the long run. And the, the idea behind this uh, is, comes with an analogy. So basically if there's a bank and it's unsecure, if equity is less than worth less than two times the actual like deposits at the bank, it doesn't really make sense for depositors to participate in that system. 
And basically up to this point, a lot of DeFi systems have been essentially arguing that, uh, that their governance token ought to be worth this because of this attack potential. But that also like has a flip side, as we're saying, that uh, uh, who's going to choose to participate in such systems? We then also introduce a potential solution to this, uh, and we're uh, sort of further investigating this uh, today, which we call optimistic approval. And the idea here is that we're essentially giving uh, users the option to veto governance changes um, uh, if there's like a malicious change that's proposed. And the idea is that this helps to sort of align the vision of, uh, of governance with the actual vision of the actual users who are, who are using stable coins in these systems. And so this is an area of sort of like uh, uh, ongoing research, but we're quite optimistic that, uh, that this can help solve some of these challenges. This then leads to sort of like uh, uh, minor extractable value sort of concerns. And uh, I see we're sort of coming up on time, so I'll sort of uh, uh, sort of cruise through this a little bit faster. Um, but a basic idea is that uh, there are several components that make attacking a stablecoin uh, kind of different from attacking traditional currencies. Uh, and it's kind of about manipulating the interaction of the agents involved in these systems, as opposed to sort of like attacking the willingness of a central bank to sort of maintain whatever target it has in mind. And the primitives were sort of developing previously in our research kind of leads to the, like these new types of attacks. So the deleveraging spirals lead to sort of like arbitrage like trades around liquidations um, and sort of more generally liquidations uh, basically automate these arbitrage opportunities. And then uh, sort of behind the scenes, we have to keep in mind that miners can censor and reorder transactions. And as we'll see, that can uh, sort of lead to extraction of, of value and sort of attacks to these systems. So we sketch out a few different attacks uh, that, uh, that, that could happen here. Um, I'll leave the, the first one sort of like more to, to understanding in the paper and sort of like sketch out what I mean about this like second attack uh, because there are some visuals here. But basically in one of these attacks, you could consider that uh, uh, the attacker sort of knows the past history, uh, maybe the past several hours. And in this history, there's been a large uh, price decline of the collateral asset, say. And if they want to, and, and this has led to a sort of liquidation events that the, that the attacker can see. Uh, and say the attacker thinks that they can, uh, they can, that it might be profitable for them to capture these liquidation events. They can essentially try to make a new timeline uh, by forking the blockchain, uh, forking the last several hours essentially of blocks. Um, and they directly inherit the Oracle price feed uh, because those transactions are already signed. And then in this uh, alternative timeline, they can inherit the current liquidations, but they can actually do worse. They can actually add liquidation events by uh, changing the uh, order of transactions or censoring sort of transactions. And one concrete idea here is that like if you are a vault and maker and you see a liquidation uh, sort of coming up, you want to top up your position or sort of like uh, scale down your position to sort of avoid that liquidation. But if you're a miner, uh, you can just censor that transaction or include it after you've actually realized the liquidation. Uh, and it's in your interest to do that. And so uh, you can actually cause more liquidations if you're sort of forking uh, the blockchain to try to do that. And we actually see sort of like variations on this that actually occurred on Black Thursday. Um, and this was sort of coming from, uh, from, from the from uh, liquidation auctions that were able to be carried out at zero die prices. And sort of after the fact, looking through forensic uh, investigation of, uh, of what happened on that day, uh, it turned out that this was uh, at least partially the result of mempool manipulation uh, causing these, uh, causing other orders to really like not be able to get in and the attackers to be able to liquidate prices at very low prices, liquidate uh, the, uh, the auctions at very low prices. And so this is actually like a realistic concern as well. So that we uh, we also set up these like forking models that like will help us to sort of understand the incentives in these systems. Um, but I think I'll sort of leave this to uh, to the paper to sort of like fully explain. But very generally, we sort of like try to do this in a tractable way by uh, considering two separate models. Uh, one for the base blockchain model where the, uh, the the miners are deciding whether or not to fork. And then an application layer model that's basically building in uh, our previous sorts of models, and then encoding a specific interaction between these models that's sort of saying like, 
uh, there's this sort of like success probability of an MEV bribe, which then sort of like influences the level of MEV, which then feeds back into influencing kind of what's happening in, the, in these different models. And we think this can lead to a very tractable way of, uh, of, of understanding these incentives, but in general, it's quite, uh, quite difficult to. So that brings us to the end of uh, the end of this talk. The papers are again available on archive if you've found this interesting. Um, and basically, we've sort of, in the course of this research, seeded uh, different stablecoin design questions and models, and have a couple sort of main takeaways that uh, that are worth remembering. And one of these takeaways is that uh, primary stablecoins today are primarily uh, leverage-based mechanisms like Dai, and these mechanisms we've seen. Uh, they need sort of add-on mechanisms to help combat deleveraging spirals. And we talked a little bit about this and a few ideas toward this, but they, uh, they can involve sort of importing custodial risks, which need to then be carefully controlled, or sort of like importing uh, participation, uh, in different participation incentives in terms of, uh, of including negative rates. Um, and it'll sort of remain to be seen like how these different things work out. And then as a second point, sort of there are amplified risks in these endogenous and implicit collateral type stable coins. And we've seen these sort of like work out in practice uh, in the past winter with, uh, with the failure of several of these basis type stable coins. And then as a last point, these, uh, these concerns about like governance and minor extractable value uh, are quite critical to sort of like the long-term incentive security of these systems. And we sort of sketch out at least the first models of, of how to start addressing these and the right things to be starting to think about uh, in those regards. And then this has led to what we see as a design gap that uh, around, the, around sort of like robust reserve backed stable coins that are sort of designed with, with liquidity in mind and also have sort of like robust governance processes that help to maintain incentives. Uh, and this has led us to sort of design sort of our next project, which is the gyroscope stablecoin. So I'm not going to focus on that in this presentation, but if it's interesting, please do check that out. Um, and then I think we have a few minutes for, for questions. So happy to open it up to that. Thanks, Soraya. Um, so if anyone has questions, you can either raise your hand or unmute yourself. Um, I can start off with one. Uh, so you mentioned that a lot of these protocols have updated after Black Thursday. So with those in mind, do you have a sense of what the perfect storm, I guess you'd call it, for stablecoin instability would be at this point? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it depends on which design path they chose for updating their designs. But for instance, if you're considering how Maker chose to update their design, which is in introducing this uh, peg stability module or exchangeability with USDC, this means that they're really tethered to sort of USDC risks. And if there's like a regulatory clampdown on USDC, that means that uh, you're back to kind of like, in, in the best case, you're back to the old maker design, but in the worst case, makers, the maker system itself is uh, sort of under collateralized if USDC fails. So that's kind of like a primary concern with how, you, how, how maker is doing it. But then uh, there are other attempts at it as well. So like, like Rye, is introducing negative rates. Um, and then it comes down to how are users going to respond to that? And Rai has kind of just come out over the last couple of months. So uh, there's not like a clear question to, to that answer, but it'll be very interesting to see how it unfolds over the next, uh, next several months and how stable it can be. Sure. And then I see a question in the chat about the die attack. Uh, so about whether it could have been prevented or how. Uh, I don't see that in the chat, but can, can you read it out fully? Uh, so it's just, how could the die attack have been prevented? Okay. Do you have any? Okay. Um, the die attack I'm taking to mean kind of this, uh, this minor extractable value idea or mempool manipulation. Um, and that is in general, like hard to completely mitigate, but it comes down to really making uh, sort of like, can you make auction markets? I think it comes down to like, how do you design these auction markets and how do you, uh, how do you make it, how do you increase the costs to essentially like uh, censoring transactions in the blockchain uh, affecting the mempool over a long period of time. But if you design these auctions, for instance, in a way where there's uh, 
one way might be sort of like introducing a reserve price as in like the min a, a starting bid um that that's not too low or sort of like uh grouping many auctions together so that there aren't sort of like thousands of different smaller auctions that uh, that uh, the liquidators have to be looking at at the same time, uh, then you can make these auction markets much more efficient potentially. Um, and if that's stretched over long sorts of time periods, then it becomes much more costly to sort of like manipulate the underlying uh, 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 blockchain or mempool. But it's not necessarily that it's, it doesn't make it impossible to do these attacks though. You can only sort of like increase the costs. And there's also a lot of works on like uh, flash bots toward like, uh, toward toward making the, the MEV sort of angle of these more efficient. And that could have like interesting complications here as well. Uh, I don't think they've actually gotten to uh, automating maker liquidation events yet but it would be quite interesting to see how they handle that also. And then I see a couple other questions in the chat. Um, Jim or Frank, would either of you like to unmute yourself or, and ask your questions? Sure, I can, I can uh, unmute. Um, uh, th thanks for the talk. Uh, what do you think about the difference between like the term stable coin versus pegged coin, i.e. like Rye is designated around like it uses like a PID controller to kind of stable around this arbitrary value, which they started at uh, uh, pi 3.14. And then it, 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 depending on the protocol, it, it, it deviates or fluctuates while DAI is pegged uh, to $1, like a dollar system. Uh, what, what do you think about the difference in, in like the terminology? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, so when I think of Rai, uh, I know they have this narrative about it being like not pegged to the dollar, but it kind of, I don't know, I kind of see it as pegged to the dollar. It's just like a, a more, it's less short-term pegged as in you have this PID controller, but it's kind of like uh, over adapted in some sense. And so you're, there's much more variation around the peg, but it does build in this discrete target of, uh, well, it's not a dollar, it's 3.14 instead, but this discrete target of like what the uh, sort of long-term uh, value should be. And um, then it comes down to just like, what are the, the actual mechanics to like uh, moving around the peg? And I guess, in some, if you want to distinguish, it's a good dis distinguish me, uh, thing to distinguish, I guess, between like this one has more variation just because that's how the design is, uh, is made. And this other one is meant to be quite tight. Um, and then uh, it'll come down to like how, how people, what, what people want to use as a product, I suppose. And my guess is that like Rai will be evolving over time to sort of like adapt what is the right form of the PID controller. Um, although I'm quite optimistic on like PID controllers overall in, in terms of being useful. Um, but I think the fundamental question then is what is the target? Not just like how much vari variation is there around the, uh, the, the target in terms of what, what the trading price is, but what is the actual target of these systems? And right now it seems like everybody wants the target to be essentially dollars, if not like being $1 being the arbitrary, like $3.14 instead, but like, touching on the value, uh, moving around the value of a dollar. But in the long term, you may not want to be actually targeting a dollar. You may want kind of like a, a crypto native uh, currency where it's targeting kind of like uh, metrics about the, uh, the cryptocurrency ecosystem itself, kind of like targeting stability in the crypto economic sense, as opposed to just like pushing that off to like a, uh, the US Federal Reserve to determine what economic stability means. And I would interpret that as changing then what are the targets of these systems? Uh, does, that, does that make sense? Is that like how you might think of it too? Yeah, yeah, th thanks, uh, thanks, thanks for that. Yeah, um, yeah, it totally makes sense. Appreciate it. Yeah, we're kind of out of time, but I, I just wanted to get your input on um, what you, how you see the current market now, um, which coins, if any, are best positioned to survive uh, the current bull market 
Um, and I promise I won't go out and buy or sell whatever you, uh, if you get specific, but really more interested in generally what, what's your take on the current landscape? Hmm. Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, preface it by not giving investment advice, obviously. Um, I am quite, well, I find most interesting these non-custodial designs. Um, but that said, like if you are from a good sort of like a jurisdiction and you have like good uh, sort of like access to banking services, um, I think I think USDC sort of like stable coins, custodial stable coins like can make sense. You should just be conscious of sort of like the risks that you're taking on, but it allows you to access some of these uh, these on-chain uh, lending markets, which are quite profitable. Um, but you have to take into account kind of like the right the risks, these custodial risks and regulatory sort of risks. Um, but kind of one idea of like the worst case scenario for 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 like USDC would be like the government comes in and uh, says this needs to be unwound and there's like a process to unwinding it. But as long as you are like sort of well banked, you'll be able to unwind your position. Um, that's not guaranteed to happen, but that's like kind of what I have in the back of my mind. But it doesn't. It, it also means that there's like complications then for for people who are actually underbanked, which is kind of like the main target of cryptocurrencies and uh, and non-custodial stablecoins in the first place. And so it's kind of unfortunate that they would be left hanging potentially in that situation. And so that's kind of why I'm most interested in like non-custodial stablecoins, just because like the real promise of crypto again was like removing, minimizing trust assumptions and counterparty risks. And if we can find sort of robust ways to do that, I find that quite exciting. And I, to be honest, I really like kind of like these leveraged based mechanisms. Um, I, it's just become apparent that like they can't work in isolation. And so like, I really like DAI. Uh, that's why I've been doing this research to try to make it stronger basically. And um, they, they've been moving toward like a sort of integrating USDC, but I also kind of wonder like, are there alternative ways that we could have, uh, could have solved the same sort of deleveraging problems, um, but still maintaining sort of like this, uh, this independence from the traditional financial system. And that's led to uh, kind of what I'm aiming to do after the PhD. So I'm, I'm finishing up the PhD right now. And the idea is sort of migrating into this, uh, this gyroscope project, which is, motivated by by all of this research that I've been doing. And I kind of see the gyroscope mechanism as a way to help combat these deleveraging sort of effects while maintaining full decentralization and maybe even like integrating with uh, with systems like Maker to essentially like provide that extra mechanism to handle these deleveraging events, but uh, still like being able to, there, there can be like a back and forth essentially with the, the extra security of these, uh, these uh, leverage-based over collateralized systems. That's very exciting. Uh, good luck in uh, your research and launching that, that new coin. Thanks for the answer. And thanks Thank for the you. talk. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank thank you so much, Arya, for for sharing your research. That, that was fascinating. And thank you everyone for for the great questions as well and, and for the participation. Uh, without further ado, uh, Arya, is there a place where maybe people in the audience or those that, that will listen later can find the slides to this presentation? Yeah, I will put them up. Cool. And yeah. then I think I think this is also recorded maybe or will, yeah. will be available to you. I can grab those from, from Sarah and then we can just put them in the description of the, of the YouTube video as well. And then we can share the video out later. Sounds good. Cool. Yeah, I'll provide you a link. Yeah, well, well, good luck in the future and uh, congratulations on, on all this research and really appreciate you taking the time. And Sarah, thank you so much for, for helping organize this and, and everything that all, all the research team and everyone at, at IC3 is doing. Um, it, it's really fascinating stuff and uh, look forward to, to working together more in the future. Thanks so much, Keenan, And thanks to Chainlink for hosting this webinar and for their continued involvement in IC3. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, everyone, and uh, have a good rest of your, your afternoons and, and days.